Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops. This is part two to congenital cardiac anomalies, which reviews briefly acyanotic anomalies. So we're talking about pink babies. Remember, as we mentioned in the previous session, the first congenital heart defect was described by Leonardo da Vinci in 1531, which was an AST, an atrial septal defect. So the learning objectives for this learn shop, part two, are just to look at some of the shunt terminology, acyanotic cardiac anomalies, some of the medical interventions and surgical interventions that might take place, and then we'll review it with some case studies or really activities for you just to reinforce what you've picked up here today. So what's a cardiac shunt? Well, the term shunt refers to an abnormal connection allowing blood to flow directly from one side of the cardiac circulation to the other. So therefore, a cardiac shunt is a pattern of blood flow in the heart that deviates from the normal circuit of the circulatory system through the heart, right to left. It can be described as right-left, left-right, bidirectional, systemic pulmonary or pulmonary systemic, which are similar in their identification. Now let's look at shunts in a little bit more detail. A left to right shunt is when blood from the left side of the heart goes to the right side of the heart. And this can occur through a hole in the ventricular or the atrial septum that divides the left and right heart. Or it can be through a hole in the wall of the artery leaving the heart called the great vessels, which are the aorta or the pulmonary artery. And what you see in the image in front of you is a patent ductus arteriosus, which again, in the post-fetal circulation, is an abnormal connection. And it causes admixture of arterial and venous blood. But we'll be reviewing that later. With left to right shunts, they're characterized by a back leak of blood from the systemic to the pulmonary circulation. And because it flows back to the pulmonary circulation, this can increase pulmonary blood flow and cause pulmonary congestion, pulmonary hypertension, and increase right ventricular cardiac workload. As a consequence of that, this can result in a, in a severe syndrome, which is a cyanotic syndrome called Eisenmenger syndrome, which we'll be discussing in part three of this Learn Shop series. And as you can see, with a chest X-ray, this can cause cardiomegaly. Right to left shunts, on the other hand, occur when there's an opening or a passage between the atria, ventricles, or an abnormal connection between the great vessels, aorta and pulmonary artery. And the right heart pressure, for some reason, is higher than the left heart pressure. And or there's a shunt that has a one-way valve opening. Now, a right to left shunt allows deoxygenated systemic venous blood to bypass the lungs and return back into the body's systemic circulation. So this is deoxygenated blood, not oxygenated blood, that goes into the systemic circulation which really wants to receive oxygenated blood. And this will cause admixture of deoxygenated and oxygenated blood, lowering the saturation. Now the most common type of right to left shunt is called tetralogy of fallow. Tetra meaning from the Latin for. Now with tetralogy of fallow there are four defects which we'll be discussing in the cyanotic part three part of this course. But however tetralogy of fallow TLF accounts for about five to six percent of all congenital heart anomalies. It's fairly common. This also results in cardiomegaly, but typically it results in a boot-shaped heart, which you can review if you look at the chest X-ray learn shops um, that are on YouTube, which are uh, included. When we look at atrial septal defects, well, there are essentially four major types of ASD atrial septal defect. Ostium secundum defect 
occurs in 90% of situations, it's the most common. Ostium primum defect, 5%. Sinus venosus defect is reasonably rare, and coronary sinus defect is also rare. As I indicated, the most common defect is the ostium secundum ASD. This also can account for a large heart, cardiomegaly. Associated syndromes with ASDs, atrial septal defects, may occur in association with a variety of disorders, which are not limited to these. It could be Down syndrome, ehlers van creveld syndrome, Optus syndrome, Costello syndrome, chondroectomal dysplasia, fetal effects of rubella, holt oram syndrome, and Hurler syndrome. Now the medical management of patients with an ASD depends on the type and the size of the defect and the effect that it's actually having on the heart because in some instances it can cause congestive heart failure associated with pulmonary hypertension which can result in the most severe syndrome called Eisenmenger syndrome. Non-surgical management of an ASD non-surgical also known as percutaneous closure. And for ASD, this is the preferred treatment for ostium secundum defects. If the ostium secundum defect, however, is not amenable to percutaneous closure, then surgery may be required. So here's an example of the procedure. Step one, the percutaneous device is inserted through the ASD, inflated and essentially left to close the device. Surgical management, which ideally is less than three years of age, less than three to six years of age, and this can either be a direct suture or a pat closure. And with a direct suture and a patch closer, this requires open heart surgery. With the eventual closure. Ventricular septal defects, there are four major types of VSD ventricular septal defect. You've got the perimembranous defect, which is the most common subtype, 70% overall. You've got the muscular ventricular defect, which accounts for about 25%. And then you have the inlet ventricular defect, which is rare, and the conoventricular defect, which is also rare. The conoventricular defect is also known as the subpulmonary or the outlet, or the supracrystal, or the doubly committed subarterial terminology. The muscular is also known as the trabecular, and the perimembranous, also known as the perimembranous or membranous. However, it's the perimembranous defects that are most common subtype, and they occur in about 70 to 80% of cases. And they can also result in cardiomegaly. Associated syndromes may include the following. Down syndrome, which is the most common. Kabuki syndrome, Turner syndrome, Costello syndrome, Williams syndrome, fetal effects of rubella, and Noonan syndrome. But not limited to these. The medical management of patients with a VSD again depends on the type and size of the defect and the effect that it's having on the heart because there can be such complications such as congestive heart failure which can be associated with pulmonary hypertension with the additional problem of endocarditis which requires prophylaxis otherwise you end up getting infestations fungal growths on valves and this requires antibiotic prophylaxis. So non-surgical management, percutaneous closure, 
again, is preferred to surgery. However, if the VSD is not amenable to percutaneous closure, then surgery may be required. So typically, a catheter is inserted into the femoral vein, because we're entering the right side of the heart. It's fed up using fluoroscopy to observe. The catheter is passed through the ventricular septal defect and if successful we get closure. Closure closes the muscular in this situation VSD. Surgical management however ideally between the, the ages of three to five and again a direct suture or a patch graft is recommended. And as a consequence of that, that will require open heart surgery again. And the end result will be closure, in this case, muscular VSD closure. Then we have more complex cardiac anomalies, such as an AV, atrioventricular canal defect, which can be partial and it can be complete or very complex. So with an AV canal defect, this is a type of congenital heart defect that has a hole in the wall separating the heart's chambers and problems with the actual heart valves. They can be abnormal or they can actually be missing. The condition may be partial involving only the atria or complex involving all four chambers of the heart, the atria and the ventricles. It can be partial or it can be complex. AV canal variations, as I said, partial means ASD with maybe a mitral valve defect, but it's not unique to this. It could be more complex than that. In a complete or complex, you've got an ASD and a VSD with tricuspid and mitral valve defects. Or you can actually have a common one, tricuspid and mitral valve which makes it really, really complex for the cardiac surgeon to correct. Cardiac image typically demonstrates cardiomegaly. Now, the surgical management is palliative or definitive. Now, with palliative surgical management, we're talking about a pulmonary artery band. And pulmonary artery banding is a palliative, temporary surgical technique. And it's used temporarily to decrease pulmonary overcirculation caused by left to right shunting. Because with overcirculation of the pulmonary circulation, as we mentioned previously, with a left to right shunt, this can cause pulmonary hypertension and eventually Eisenmenger syndrome, which is a terminal condition. So pulmonary artery banding essentially reduces pulmonary artery blood flow and it's reserved in a certain subset of infants with complex congenital heart disease that results in severe left to right shunting of blood. So the band is placed on the pulmonary trunk and this reduces pulmonary blood flow as a result of left to right shunting. Now the definitive surgical management, ideally less than three to five years of age, and this involves a valve repair or a patch graft. And this is for complex AV canal defects. And this is where surgeons have to separate an abnormally large single valve in some instances between the upper and lower chambers of the heart, atria and ventricles, and they have to somehow refashion them into two valves. If separating a single valve isn't possible, then heart replacement, then sorry, heart valve replacement of both the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve may be needed. So tricuspid and mitral valve replacement. Complex cardiac surgery. There's the defect there, for example. They're not all just like this. So we have a single leaflet here, for example, 
on the mitral valve and a single leaflet on the tricuspid valve and they sort of work together. But we look like we've got a perimembranous BSD. We also look like we've got an ASD. So this is complex. And hopefully, which isn't often the case, we result now in separation of the right heart circulation and the left heart circulation. And everything is working nicely. But typically, it's not that easy for cardiac surgeons to create this situation following complex cardiac AV canal defects. The next defect that we're going to review is called the patent ductus arteriosus or a persistent ductus arteriosus. Now the PDA is a persistent opening between two major blood vessels, the aorta and the pulmonary artery, which lead from the heart. Now the opening, ductus, arteriosus, is a normal part of the fetal circulation, which we reviewed in part one, in utero, that usually closes shortly after birth or certainly within several days to a week following birth. Now the ductus should close. However, sometimes it doesn't. And variations of the ductus, the patent ductus arteriosus, can be either a restrictive defect or a non-restrictive defect. And typically, it may occur in syndromes such as Down syndrome, which is the most common. And in this syndrome, it occurs in about 7% of situations. Now, a restrictive PDA is narrow, small, and typically asymptomatic, with a diameter of typically less than four millimeters. However, in a non-restrictive, it can be wide, long, diameter greater than five to 10 millimeters, and this can eventually cause congestive heart failure, and if severe, eventually death. There are lots of variations of it. I've just included these ones here. You've got a type A, which can be cone-shaped. You've got a type B, which is like a window. You've got type C, which can be tubular. You've got type D, which can be complex. And you've got type E, which is again referred to as being elongated. But it can result in cardiomegaly. And typically you may see a variation around the aorta arch on chest X-ray. But this typically requires expert interpretation from a radiologist. If we had an aortogram, you can see here in the image that there's the ductus, which connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. Now the medical management for patients with PDA depends again on the type and size of the defect and its effect on the heart, because again, it can result in congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, left to right shunt. That's essentially what's happening here. And as a consequence of that, you may get Eisenmenger syndrome, or you could even have endocarditis, and that requires prophylaxis. Indomethazone is indicated for patent ductus arteriosus closure because it promotes closure of the PDA and generally has an onset of action within minutes. So prostaglandins are especially important in the fetal circulation to maintain patency of the ductus. It's an important component of the fetal circulation. However, things require avoiding congestive heart failure and indomethacin. Indomethacin is the prostaglandin inhibitor. Now the non-surgical management of PDA Again, you can have a percutaneous closure device. However, again, if percutaneous closure isn't amenable, surgery may be required. And in this situation, if surgery is required, it doesn't require open heart surgery, it just requires open chest surgery. So cardiopulmonary bypass is not probably going to be um, recommended. You can have coil devices, there's an example here where a coil has been inserted. The surgical management, ideally, 
is less than two years of age. And this can either be as a result of direct suture or a patch graft. Here's a nice image that shows you ligation of the PDA, which appears to be tubular. non-restrictive. Another common anomaly is aortic valve stenosis, congenital aortic valve stenosis. And this refers to a narrowed aortic valve with varying degrees of obstruction. Usually the valve is bicuspid, but other variations can exist. Remember the aortic valve is typically tricuspid or has three leaflets. Aortic stenosis is a spectrum in which the degree of obstruction can range from mild to severe. There are variations to aortic valve stenosis as well. And in relation to what causes it, a single specific genetic cause of aortic valve stenosis hasn't really been identified. But they have identified that it occurs more often in males compared to females with a ratio of 3 to 1 uh, extending to a range of 5 to 1. And it's often associated with congenital heart disease, which includes patent ductus soteriosis, coarctation of the aorta, and ventricular septal defects. As I said, in a normal situation, typically the aortic valve has got three leaflets. And commonly, there will only be two leaflets, bicuspid. Aortic valve stenosis, when closed, still the valve can leak. When it's open, it doesn't open very effectively. It's narrowed. So closure and opening are both affected, which can result in regurgitation, which means backflow into the left ventricle or it doesn't allow proper emptying. So there's a forward and a backward problem. Now there are typically three types of valve associations. The valve that's most common is that the valve itself is affected 90% of cases. Or it can be subvalva below or supervalva above. This will result in left ventricular hypertrophy in some instances and certainly cardiomegaly. The medical management again depends on the type and size of the defect and its effect on the heart as it can result in congestive heart failure associated with pulmonary hypertension and because it's a valve problem here endocarditis which requires prophylaxis with antibiotics. Now, the non-surgical management of aortic valve stenosis can be a percutaneous procedure called a balloon valvuloplasty, or some people just refer to it as a valvuloplasty. And this is a procedure that widens the aortic valve, which is narrowed. During this procedure, a thin flexible catheter is inserted via fluoroscopy into the femoral artery. The catheter has got a small balloon at the tip, and when the catheter reaches the stenosis, identified with fluoroscopy, the balloon is inflated and deflated several times by the physician, a cardiologist who's an interventionalist. The balloon will, have, will widen, hopefully, the AV opening and decrease the stenosis, but in some instances it reoccurs. So here's an example, the balloon via the femoral artery into the descending aorta, aortic arch, into the ascending aorta and through to the identified aortic valve where the balloon is inflated. The non-surgical treatment can also include a TAVI, a transcatheter valve implantation. And TAVI is a common procedure 
that allows an artificial aortic valve to be implanted using a balloon inflated catheter. And the catheter is typically inserted into the femoral artery or through a small incision in the chest. And it is directed through the apex of the heart into the correct position. But we'll look at it the transarterial approach. So there's the catheter that's been inserted into the femoral artery, descending aorta, aortic arch, ascending aorta, into the left ventricle. The balloon is positioned nicely. It's inflated first and then following which a valve can be implanted. So the end result basically is that you've got a valve that is left in the correct position and this should limit or decrease the size of the stenosis. The definitive surgical management can include these. I've just included these four but there are numerous others and ideally less than two years of age is recommended. This can include a patch repair which is also the Conan Rastin repair, a valve repair, valve replacement or an autograft which is called the Ross procedure. With a patch repair, the Conan Rastin repair, a valve repair, a replacement of the actual valve, or an autograft. And with an autograft, this is where the diseased aortic valve and a portion of the aortic artery are removed. The pulmonic valve and a portion of the pulmonary artery are excised and placed in the aortic position that was resected. The left and right coronary arteries are attached into the new aortic artery, which is the pulmonary artery. And a homograft, an allograft, which includes the pulmonary valve and part of a pulmonary artery, are placed into where the pulmonary artery was. This is the Ross procedure. But remember, this will be a cardiac surgeon decision because if the infant is small, it may require a new valve at different stages of their development as they head towards adulthood. But these are some of the definitive surgical management procedures, but there are more. When we look at coarctation of the aorta, coarctation of the aorta is a birth defect in which part of the aorta is narrowed. Now, coarctation of the aorta is relatively common and accounts for about 5 to 8 percent of all congenital heart defects. Coarctation of the aorta may occur as an isolated defect or an association with various other lesions and most commonly aortic valve stenosis, bicuspid aortic valve or VSD, ventricular septal defect. Now typically there are three variations of coarctation of the aorta which can be preductal, which is narrowing that's proximal to the ductus arteriosus. It can be ductal which is narrowing that occurs at exactly where the ductus is inserted, or it can be postductal, which is narrowing that's distal to the insertion of the ductus arteriosus. Preductal and postductal are viewed here, and if we had an aortogram, you could see this would be a postductal coarctation of the aorta. On chest x-ray, there are numerous signs that you can see. I've just highlighted one called the inverted three sign. The medical management, again, depends on the type and size of the defect and its effect on the heart and the systemic circulation. Because again, if the defect is severe, it can result in decreased blood flow to the 
distal circulation, such as the femoral arteries, popliteal, dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial, etc., and have an effect on blood supply to the limbs. Complications could include congestive heart failure and could be associated with pulmonary hypertension. Non-surgical management of coarctation of the aorta can include balloon aortoplasty. And this is a procedure that widens the coarctation or narrowing of the aorta. And during this procedure, again, a small, thin, flexible catheter is inserted into the femoral artery. And the catheter's got a small balloon at the tip. And when the catheter reaches the coarctation, which is identified by fluoroscopy in the cardiac catheter laboratory, it's inflated and deflated several times. And the balloon widens the narrowed aorta. There is a reoccurrence rate for this, especially in adults. But it happens in paediatrics as well. So, a thin, flexible catheter is inserted into the descending aorta, identifies the coarctation fluoroscopically. There it is there. Then the balloon is inflated at the side of the coarctation. And the consequence should be a decrease in the size or an increase in the lumen following inflation. Another extension could be balloon aortoplasty and a stent. And this is a procedure again that widens the narrowed aorta. A thin flexible catheter is inserted in the femoral artery. The catheter's got a small balloon. It's inflated and deflated several times, but it leaves behind a metal mesh tube called a stent. And it's left inside the aorta to keep it open. Here we see again, guide wire, catheter, side of coarctation. viewed, it's inflated to increase the opening of the coarctation, a stent is then left in place and there's an example of now the coarctation with stent. The definitive management however if it's surgical ideally at a greater age than five and certainly less than 20 years of age because there'll be too, too many complications associated with the coarctation if it's left untreated. It's typically avoided in infant surgery because there's a high mortality and it does require prophylaxis as in bacterial endocarditis could occur. Now typically there's the end to end anastomosis, the patch repair, the Waldhausen repair and extra anatomic shunts but there are other variations that can be used. I've just highlighted these because they are the most common. So we have end-to-end -end anastomosis repair. We have the patch repair. We have the Waldhausen repair, which utilizes the left subclavian artery. And we have extra anatomic shunts to bypass the obstruction. Dacron shunts. Now let's conclude this learn shop with an activity review. Can you identify the following cardiac anomaly in this slide? Look carefully. It's an atrial septal defect and it's an osteom secundum defect, the most common. What about this cardiac anomaly? This is a ventricular septal defect and it's muscular. Not the most common, remembering that perimembranous is the most common. What about this cardiac anomaly? 
This is a persistent or patent ductus arteriosus and it appears to be tubular and non-restrictive. What about this defect? This is coarctation of the aorta and it's postductal. What about this one? This is an aortic valve stenosis and it's supra valva. What about the surgical intervention? This is ligation of the patent ductus arteriosus. What about the surgical intervention here? This is an end-to-end -end anastomosis for repair of coarctation of the aorta. Postductal. Well, thanks again, everyone. Now, if you found this Learn Shop of any value, please recommend it to your colleagues. And this is the end of part two, and we'll follow with part three, which is cyanotic blue baby congenital cardiac anomalies and the medical and surgical management for say. Thanks again. See you hopefully in the next course.